Uh, Rita, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, why don't we start with a basic question about why so many good companies fail at growth? Fail at growth. And we see that a lot. Um, we have a, a file that we used when studying the book, which uh, I call it my flops file. You have to lose your parent company at least $50 million to get into my flops file. And it's, you know. Um, and the big dilemma is that what they tend to do is use conventional approaches that work very well when you've got a lot of knowledge to try to get into new spaces. And it sets in motion this really dysfunctional pattern of behavior. So here's an example. Uh, you want to get money for a project. You put together you know, a PowerPoint deck that's like 100 slides with all this backup detail and all these spreadsheets. And you go to whoever's got the resources. And you make this big pitch. right? And then they say, OK. So now you set off and discover two or three months in, gee, you know, the market wasn't exactly what you thought, and the service delivery requirements aren't exactly what you thought, and maybe the product needs to be tweaked. Well, now you've got this huge commitment that you're supposed to live up to. So I think the first dilemma that we see in companies that causes them to fail so systematically is this presumption that you can be right in a world of massive uncertainty. Uh, and that leads to these kind of dysfunctional behaviors. I think the second thing that companies do that gets in their own way is insisting on financial metrics that make no sense when you're looking at a new business. So a typical company will insist on, say, a net present value calculation or a discounted cash flow calculation. It's nice to be back here at Wharton talking with the prices like that. Um, when, in, in effect, what you're doing is, in many cases, you're buying option value. You're buying uh, the right, but not the obligation, to continue to make further investments. And so using these present value, internal rate of return kind of requirements almost sets you up for failure, because they build in inflexibility into the system. So what I think I would argue is that it's not that planning for new businesses or planning for growth opportunities is undisciplined. And that's where people go wrong. They think it's undisciplined. It's not. It's just a very different kind of discipline. It's the discipline that, for example, habitual entrepreneurs use or people that start multiple businesses involving a lot of learning, a lot of change, a lot of redirection. And that's actually OK. So, so based on what you just said, how should companies actually be thinking about growth at a time of uncertainty? At a time of uncertainty. And, and, and could you give any examples of companies that are doing it right? Oh, sure. Um, well, I think at a time of uncertainty, the first thing you need to do is stop panicking. Um, I think the next thing is to take a look at your whole portfolio of activities. When times are good, to be honest, people get a little sloppy, companies get a little sloppy, and it's easy for things that are not value added or things that really aren't going to be a route to your future to kind of hang out there because they're not doing anybody any harm and maybe we're historically affiliated with them and so on. So I think the first thing I would do is take a look at where resources could be freed up. So if you take some concrete examples, a company like Verizon getting out of the directory business. It's not that it's not a good business. It's not that it doesn't have great cash flow. But if they're going to make investments in the initiatives that will form their future, they've got to get the resources from somewhere, and that's one. Um, there's some talk right now, for example, that uh, Time Warner should be selling AOL's dial-up business, because even though it's generating cash flow, it's kind of distracting the company from the future it needs to create. So I think the first question I would ask is, are there places you can free up some resources, not a lot necessarily, some resources, to um, get into some of these growth spaces? The next thing I would do is set up uh, a small, not very big, but small, a small or a couple of small groups to really go out and look at where you could find growth relatively soon. So in a, say, 9 to 10 month horizon, start to get some things going which could take you in a path towards higher growth areas. And recognize that if you don't make those investments, that it's basically setting in motion a long-term negative for your company. It's a bit like having credit card debt at an early age. You know, it just sets in motion these um, inabilities down the road to, to, to do future things. And then the last thing I would say in tough times, what you want to be thinking about is, am I creating enough option value to merit um, looking at these areas uh, a little bit more? So you want to really be thinking about that even as the times are tough. Now, who's doing it well? And in the last few weeks, I've visited wonderful companies like General Electric, uh, IBM. I'm giving a talk for them pretty soon. And sure, you know, they're not happy with <laughs> the way their stock is being treated, and they're not happy with the fact that, um, you know, maybe sales that they were counting on haven't happened. But that doesn't stop them. They're not paralyzed by it. Um, their basic position is you can't. You can't change your whole strategy. You can't throw everything overboard because a year has been really bad. Um, and so they're really looking more towards how do we build the best foundation we can going forward. Uh, so let, let's say a company uh, wants to do exactly what you described, and it wants to 
use discovery driven growth uh, and, and set up its own initiative. Mm -hmm. How should it go about designing that initiative? Designing it? Um, well, different companies will do it differently, uh, but I think there are some principles in common. I think the first principle is you can't allocate growth projects to people who are already just screamingly busy. That just is dysfunctional, uh, and it won't get the attention it deserves. So I think the first principle is you need some kind of dedicated resource. Now, that can be associated with an established business. It can be set somewhat aside, but in general we found that it has to be a group, probably a small group, who's really just focused on the, the new areas. That's their main job. Um, I think you also want to be thinking about um, whether, you know, what kind of company culture are you? Are you a top-down kind of company where whatever the boss says goes and that's what we do? In which case, you know, you better get the boss's blessing and th this group is known to be supported by the boss and, and so forth. Other companies, not so much. So in other companies, what, what we found is once you've got this focal group set up, that they actually work best by doing a lot of coalition building and a lot of brokering with other parts of the firm. In some companies, they've actually restructured to a company uh, to, to create growth opportunities at DuPont, for example, which we worked with, a company we worked with for many years, they had a almost religious dedication to the concept of the strategic business unit. And the assets in the company and the revenues all went together in these strategic business units. And what they found out was that a lot of their great growth opportunities were falling in between their conventional units. So what they did was created this growth group and, and, and got people thinking about growth, built the right toolkit for growth, but then actually created these call them growth platforms, which create that cross-business uh, connection necessary to get some of these growth drivers to occur. So I think the principles you want to think about are dedicated resource, clear line of sight to the top so that you've got that executive endorsement um, and focus on a few key things that are going to be valuable possibly in the future. I'm not a big believer in new business development or innovation groups being allowed to launch businesses themselves. It tends to them becoming fiefdoms and people then want to make a career out of it and you don't want that. What you ideally want is your innovation group or whatever you call it uh, to be a place where people come and spend a few great years, learn a lot and then take that learning into your core businesses. And it's sort of a, um, an incubator of people as well as of business ideas. I wonder if you could go back to, to something which you, that you said earlier when talking about GE and IBM. Uh, obviously, it's a tough business environment. The, the stocks are being hammered, sales are down. Uh, would you implement uh, a growth strategy differently during a downturn of the kind that we have today? Uh, than you would say in a boom period. Could you could you help understand, yeah, explain yeah. How, 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 how would you implement this strategy during a severe downturn? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in a severe downturn, the concept of discipline becomes more important than ever. And in fact, one of the benefits, I think, of this approach is it gets more attractive when you have less resources because you just don't have the money to do what I alluded to earlier, spend a lot of money and get yourself way down uh, a track before you know what you're doing. So I think the differences are you would you would find this more attractive, I think, in a downturn than when there's a lot of money floating around. The other interesting thing about downturns is that they do create a lot of discipline. So what you'll have is less tendency for people to go off on efforts which are not going to be successful. You're also going to see more discipline around shutting things down that need to get shut down. And we're seeing that now even with companies like Google that are very successful on getting out of their radio ad business because they feel they've given it long enough and uh, they haven't really... Um, broken through. So I think the key message for a downturn is, 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 you know, don't lose your head. Realize that this makes sense uh, under uncertain conditions and don't be afraid to make some modest investments in exploring where your future might lie. One other interesting wrinkle for downturns is one of the things we're seeing that's brand new is people's core businesses, you know, businesses where they thought they had a lot of predictability, where they thought there was a lot they knew, are kind of sliding over into that very uncertain space. And so another suggestion I would make is don't assume you know what's going on in your core business. Be prepared to do what we say in the book, which is stop, write down your most significant assumptions and see how they're mapping against the changing realities that you're dealing with right now. So it's a very useful discipline in both environments. And during a boom, how, how would that change? Well, in a boom, it's easier to get resources, and there are more segments of the economy that are fast growth. So I think in a boom, it's just it's easier. The, the barriers are lower. Now, the problem with booms is that they produce a lot of stupid behavior. <laughs> you know, um, companies true. can afford to make big mistakes, so they go ahead and do it. Um, and there's this sort of thought that we, oh, we can just spend the money because who needs to worry? And uh, I won't name them, but I have a client who just 
makes a lot of money. And there's no discipline at all around their project process. They just, anybody that's senior enough can get their pet project funded and there's no kind of coherence in the corporation about what's going on. So booms have their downsides uh, too. But of course it does, it does make it easier. Well, to, to, uh, to end, I wonder if, uh, you know, if in this room right now we had a few CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and they wanted to know uh, from your book, what are some of the things that they can implement right away? Right away. What, what advice would you give them? What advice would I give them? I think I'd tell them first that a lot of strategy today is about learning. It's not about sustainable competitive advantage. It's not about the sort of stable industry forces that we're used to thinking about when we're thinking about strategy. So I would encourage them to think of strategy as a very dynamic entity. And that means changes in behavior on their part. They need to stop talking about being right all the time. Uh, instead, what we want to talk about is being disciplined. Um, you need to stop talking about failures bad. And instead, you want to think about intelligent failures, you know, low-cost intelligent failures that are rich in learning. And that tone can only be set from the top. If you're the kind of CEO who, you know, off with his head the minute something doesn't work out the way somebody predicted, I suspect you're going to have a lot of trouble in these incredibly dynamic strategic environments. Uh, Mac, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Could you explain the concept of discovery-driven growth and how it differs from traditional ways of thinking about growth? Um, well, let's start off with the current mess we're in economically. The world's become a lot, a lot more uncertain. And managers really need to begin to be able to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. And uh, when things are uncertain, you really don't know what the outcome is going to be. So in conventional planning, what you do is you sort of project what the future should look like and then you build the plan with a fair level of confidence because you have a knowledge base that you can use to do your projections. In uncertain environments, you don't have knowledge. You have to make assumptions. And the uh, key issue is uh, I know when I start my plan that the plan's wrong. That's the only thing I know about the plan is that it's wrong. So how do I plan in such a way that I come out with the right solution but uh, not necessarily know what it is at the outset? And that's what discovery-driven planning is all about. It's a plan to learn. We don't know, so what we're going to learn? And uh, what you really want to do is you want to learn cheap and you want to learn fast. And if it's wrong, you want to go and do something else or you want to redirect. And that's the idea. So could you uh, explain the principal steps that a company needs to go through to create a growth framework? The first thing that I think is important is to kind of set a fairly firm target about what you'd like to accomplish. You may come back later and change it, but you start off with something that you think is worthwhile. Because if you're going to do something that's really uncertain, then when you get to the end of the road, you need to be able to look back and say all that energy and effort was worthwhile. So you set a frame, and uh, the second thing to do is then sort of say, if this is what I need to accomplish, what is the scope of what needs to be done? How much physically must happen? So if I want to make a million dollars, how many you know, buckets of stuff must I sell uh, in order to get that million dollars? And that gives you a sense of what the physical challenge is as well as the economic challenge. Step number two is to begin to sort of say, well, what are the activities that I must undertake in order for me to be able to deliver this plan. How will people know that I have an offering? How will people search for that offering? How will they be able to uh, buy whatever I'm doing? What processes must be in place for them to be able to receive whatever I'm uh, delivering? How are they going to use it? How do I need to service it? Each one of these items, which we call a consumption chain, is the consumer or the customer experiencing your offering and your company. Each one of those involves a cost or an asset commitment. So you specify what we call a deliverable specification that says what are the physical things that need to be delivered in order for the financials to be delivered. So that's step, the second step. The third step is to basically say, well, I'm making assumptions about what these costs are going to be or these assets are going to be. How am I going to test them? So I document all the assumptions that I'm making and then I test these assumptions. I plan to test these assumptions at checkpoints. And uh, so, for instance, I might develop a model of the product if it's a product I'm making. I might build a, uh, do a market test. I might do some focus group. But each one of these checkpoints, what I do is I come back and test whether my assumptions are right or not. 
Uh, to the extent that they write, I continue. To the extent that they not write, I shut down the project. So I deliberately design checkpoints where I can learn. And now the last challenge is to creatively invest only as you learn. So in the beginning you invest very little, so you can afford to be wrong. And as you get more and more confident in your, in your assumptions, which may change, and as you redirect the project, you may make bigger and bigger investments. In, in your book, you also talk about creating reverse financials and an assumption, assumptions checklist. Yes. Uh, could you explain those concepts? Well, typically what happens when somebody designs a conventional plan is they start off with the revenues they hope to get, they estimate what the costs are, they subtract the costs from the revenues, and that tells them what the profits are going to be. A reverse income statement starts with the profits I must make to make it worthwhile. I can then calculate what the maximum cost can be in order for me to make those profits and then what the revenue should be in order for me to make the profits. So you start with the income statement at the bottom and you work up instead of starting at the top and working down. And that's what we mean by reverse financials. Because very rapidly you may find that uh, in order for you to be able to make the numbers that you plan to make in terms of profits, all you need is 5,000% market share at which stage you say, oops, let's go and do something else, because you really don't know, but it gives you a sense of what the scope is. And then the next step is to do the deliverable specification that I spoke about before. In order for this to happen, for, in order for me to get one dollar, one rupee, you know, one ruble worth of revenues, I need to put something in a customer's hand. The customer needs to say, yes, I want it, I'm going to pay for it. What does it take to actually get the object into the customer's hands? So that's your deliverable specification. And then what we do is say, in order for us to deliver this business and this consumption chain that we've designed, what checkpoints are we going to use that allow us to drive down the cost of failure? Well, can you give an example of a company that has gone through this process? Well, the, the company that I think has been the most successful would be Air Products. And, and what's interesting about Air Products and, you know, is, is that um, this is a company that's 60 years old, uh, was established a long, long time ago, and it built its, uh, its profit streams on, on the basis of industrial gases, selling things like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, you know, really exciting, interesting stuff. And they elected to start to look at diversifying what they were doing so that they just didn't find themselves constantly in a place where they had to cut price below cost and make it up on volume. And, uh, and so uh, 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 they, uh, they started to use discovery-driven planning to push into new spaces. And some of the uh, things that they're looking at now pretty aggressively is, uh, since we're very good at being able to measure, use telemetry to find out what the stocks are of our various gases all over the country, why don't we take our telemetry capabilities and begin to build businesses around that? And so, for instance, one of the things they're seriously looking at is to use it for tracking uh, uh, the status of uh, 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 patients with chronic illnesses so that you can constantly monitor what the, uh, what the uh, uh, level is of whatever thing you're kind of trying to control. And it's a very, very new business. And because it was so new and because it was so different, conventional planning would just not have worked. Uh, you also talk in your book about the art of disengagement. Could you explain what that means and why is that important for growth? Okay. If we recognize that the world is getting more uncertain, if we acknowledge that because it's getting more uncertain, managers will have to make investment decisions in the face of much greater uncertainty. If we recognize that because of that uncertainty, the chances that you write are very low, that basically means that the normal condition is you're wrong. And so what you need to stop doing is obsessing about being right, because you can't be right, or very rarely can you be right. So the real issue is then is, is if I am likely to be wrong, then how do I plan in such a way that the cost of being wrong is as low as possible? What you also need to be thinking about is if I go out there and I try to build this new enterprise or this new product or this new market, uh, there will be people who are going to be disappointed. So what I need to think about is as I retreat, if I find that I must, and I can't redirect because the, the most preferred alternative is to redirect the business to where there looks to be opportunity. But let's say that doesn't work. 
you need to plan ahead of time how are you going to disengage from that project if it doesn't work out. And, and so a, a critical discipline, and it's, it's kind of like, in a way, let's plan our divorce case before we even get married. Uh, uh, a critical discipline is to recognize that you could be wrong, and that basically means we may have to retreat, and let's do it in such a way that the, uh, as few people are damaged as possible, that we have really serious damage control. And that means we need to plan how to disengage uh, if we even begin to undertake it. If we find that we can disengage, unless at great cost to people like customers or distributors or suppliers or employees, don't go for it because the cost of being wrong is just too high. And therefore, you, the, the fundamental rule is that you want to fail cheap because you can fail often uh, is, is now betrayed and, and, and you'll find yourself failing expensive. And that's what you don't want. How would you implement discovery-driven growth during a severe downturn of the kind that we face today? And how does that differ from how you would think about it in a booming economy? Okay. In a downturn, I think the fundamental problem is to, is, well, here's the issue. There's a legal condition of a business that's called insolvency. And as you move into insolvency, all the rules change. You know, you're a very, very different company if you've been declared insolvent. So the most critical issue is to find ways of reducing the probability of insolvency. The typical response of many companies, and we see it right now, is management comes in and says, fire the left half of the building. You know, cut costs across the board by 30%. It's just mindless cost cutting. And, 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 and what you're doing in many cases is you're getting rid of people who are very, very valuable to you. As uncertainty increases, it becomes more and more important to recognize that whatever moves you make are unlikely to be you know, as successful as you would hope. So the need to discovery-driven plan now starts to move towards what actions can we take to maximize cash inflow and minimize cash outflow and what innovations can we do to the way that we run our operating business with the full knowledge that even as we try, we might find three or four months in that it's not working. And by God, we better then do something to make sure that it does work, otherwise we end up in the bankruptcy court. So the focus here to me would be to focus on how do we use discovery-driven planning to uh, take out costs that don't add value for customers, uh, to reduce expenses and assets that are unnecessary for the ongoing uh, part of the business, yet at the same time, take the people in the company who have time now freed up and use them as resources to be invested in building your position with your core customers. And the definition of the core customer changes because today in this kind of environment, the core customer is not the person who brings me lots and lots of revenues. It's the person who brings me lots and lots of cash flow, and they may not be the same. So uh, in this environment, we're looking at enhancing cash flows uh, and, and putting in place projects that, that significantly improve our cash flows and focusing on who the, what we are starting to call the cash darlings are, the people that you know, are most responsible for creating cash flow for us and pay our attention to them and not to the ones who just place big orders and then don't pay you. And in the boom, how does this change? Well, here what you're looking at is how do I expand my capacity to deliver to the customers who are going to give me future streams of revenues with the associated profit streams. So you build revenues, but in the background is, you know, you don't, you, you, your, your, your stock's value is not based on revenues. Your stock's value is based on, on profit streams. So I need to be thinking now about the customers who give me uh, uh, you know, increased revenues with an, an, a, a fairly high level of confidence that that will be accompanied by, by uh, profit flows. But here what I'm looking at now is how do I grow my, my, my asset base and how do I deploy and grow my uh, employee base in such a way that I chase only the very best customers. Mac, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome.